in the challenge to talk about the dilemma with the HIV exposed uninfected children, who I'll refer to as HEUs many times throughout the study, I thought it best to kind of give you guys a background for who that HEU population is. Among them, what are some of the selected disparities in health outcomes, looking both at mortality and morbidity? and then kind of go through a framework of the surveillance challenges for this group. So we start the story with uh, the 2011 UNAIDS publication, Countdown to Zero, on the left, uh, outlining the global plan for eliminating new HIV infections among children and keeping their mothers alive. And this was published as a global plan uh, in 2011, and there were four updates, including the final status progress report in 2015 that showed some quite impressive gains toward the aims of uh, Countdown to Zero. Unfortunately, we did not achieve Countdown to Zero by 2015, and therefore, UNAIDS and PEPFAR joined forces with the Stay Free, uh, I'm sorry, Start Free, Stay Free, AIDS Free campaign. And this was a program galvanizing global momentum around a shared and ambitious agenda. It provides a roadmap for fast tracking specifically to a 2020 goal of having fewer than 20,000 HIV infected infants. While these programs are unquestionably necessary because HIV is clearly preventable as a vertical transmission issue, I wonder if we're setting the right targets. In the end, I wonder if we should be thinking about these children who are exposed to HIV, many of whom are exposed to ARVs in utero, and ensuring that they survive and thrive, not merely remain HIV free. So let's take a look at this population. So using the spectrum data, we can see that there has been very little change in the number of HIV-infected women who become pregnant, 1.4 million per year from 2010 to 2015. The dark blue section below of this graph uh, shows the number of women who actually were accessing ARVs over time, and we see an impressive increase from 715,000 in 2010 to 1.1 million by 2015. Not surprisingly, this translates to a declining HIV acquisition rate by infants from 290,000 in 2010 down to 150,000 by 2015. But as Nelson Mandela once said, after climbing a great hill, one only finds that there are many more great hills to climb. And in this maturing HIV epidemic, I think the HEU population is one of the next hills that we need to be climbing. In fact, the size of the HEU population far exceeds that of our HIV-infected infants. Here in the blue section, we can see that the population has expanded from 1.1 million children to 1.25 million by 2015. And the UNAIDS spectrum data indicates that an increasing number of these children have been exposed both to HIV and ARVs in utero. From 65% of the children HEUs in 2010 to 88% by 2015. It's an absolute success story. And, and it's been achieved because goals have been set and supported by PMTCT funding. Looking at this, though, in another way, if we look at the accumulation of births from 2010 to 2015, in that five-year period, we now have 7.1 million HEU children under the age of five, 5.6 million who have also been exposed in utero to antiretrovirals. So let's walk through some of the health disparities. These are forest plots from two meta-analyses. On the left, uh, Stanzi, who will be presenting in a moment, uh, had looked at, with her colleagues, 28 studies in 12 African countries involving 33,000 children, 11,000 of which were HIV exposed and uninfected. 
Uh, Lana Brennan on the right looked at 22 studies, 29,000 children overall, 9,000 HEUs. The two publications overlapped by eight studies, looking at mortality between HEUs and HIV unexposed. And what we can see is both of them came up with very similar answers. Almost a two-fold higher risk of mortality from being HIV exposed uninfected. Confidence intervals overlap between the studies. And in Alana Brennan's study, they went on to look at when the mortality was happening, and we can see the highest mortality in the under 12 months at 1.8, or an 80% increased risk. But that increased risk still exists in the 12 to 24 month period and beyond. Very concerning. Let's look at this a little bit different way. This is, I, I work in Botswana, and uh, this is a WHO graph of actual neonatal infant and under five mortality over time in the green lines, with the brown line being a projection for what was then the millennial development goal of reducing under five mortality. And I want to use two studies to think about this HEU mortality issue. So the first is the Michaelelo study, uh, for which Roger Shapiro is the principal investigator, and um, there has been published work by Rebecca Zash on this. Background on the study, it involved 3,000 mother-infant pairs that were recruited at five hospital sites in Botswana between 2012 and 2013. And these children, or the mothers, were followed at one month, three months, and every three months thereafter through 24 months with phone calls. For the HIV-exposed uninfected children, we inquired about uh, their testing results to make sure that they were getting tested, and we, require, we inquired about mortality. And what we can see is that the mortality rate in this group was 47.3 per 1,000 live births in the HEU group and 16 per 1,000 live births in the HIV unexposed group. When we look at under five mortality and we do not report out separately HIV exposed from HIV unexposed, we may be masking a real driver of mortality, and, and Amy Slogrove will be talking about that in the next abstract presentation. Caveats with this, only 13% of the HIV exposed uninfected children breastfed, whereas nearly 100% of the HIV unexposed breastfed. So feeding differences certainly contribute, but a low touch observational study with phone calls. Contrast that with the Impepu study. The Impepu study was an infant survival study enrolling 2,400 mother-infant pairs, all of which were women living with HIV in their infants. The study was designed to detect whether or not cotrimoxazole um, ha had a survival benefit, um, and half of the infants were randomized to cotrimoxazole from one month to 15 months of life, and the other half were randomized to placebo. There was no difference in mortality outcome by that randomization or by breastfeeding versus formula feeding, and yet we see a much, much lower mortality rate. Why would that be? Well, one of the differences is we saw these moms and infants in clinic. The clinicians were blinded to the randomization arm, but we did look at vaccinations, weight gain, mom's health, and referred into clinic. Very significant difference in mortality, and it looks much closer to the HIV unexposed. It's a complex problem. Um, Amy Slogov has outlined this nicely in this conceptual model where we can see that our HIV-exposed, uninfected children face some of the very same risks that all newborns face. Being born preterm, suboptimal infant growth, infectious pathogen exposure, I'm sorry, um, maternal morbidity and mortality, and living in poverty conditions all contribute to poor outcomes but so do the unique exposures, the exposure to the HIV viral particle, maternal 
uh, immune compromised state, which in turn may play into the child's immune compromised state, and the antiretroviral drug exposure. So let's take a look at birth outcomes. Rebecca Zash reported on this at Croy. And what's important about this is in a study of over 40,000 births in Botswana at eight facilities in which 45% of the births in the country were captured in this study, 48% of the women had initiated ARVs prior to conception. We see that there is higher preterm birth among women who are taking antiretrovirals, but not all antiretrovirals are similar. And that brings up the challenge that not only do we need to monitor HEU health, but we also need to know what they were exposed to. It takes detailed monitoring, and it's very challenging, particularly in resource-limited settings. Same story here on the Sapamo study with small for gestational age, and yet we know low birth weight and SGA are two drivers of mortality. But we can't throw the baby out with the bathwater. Antiretrovirals are here to stay. They have to be here. And so we heard this morning about the importance of pharmacovigilance. Let's just quickly look at lung health as an example. So the two leading causes of morbidity and mortality in HEUs are respiratory disease and diarrheal disease. We know that being born preterm or being born small for gestational age affects lung health, both in the immediate and in the long term in adult life. We know that inadequate breastfeeding, just in the general pediatric, pediatric population, less than six months of exclusive breastfeeding puts these children um, at risk for respiratory disease. And even non-severe respiratory disease can compromise lung function. HEUs are exposed to increased pathogens in their households, strep pneumo, tuberculosis, pneumocystis, and again, higher risk for infectious disease. And we can't quite sort out yet what the impact of the viral particles or the drugs are um, for the in utero exposure piece. In this particular study from NISD and LILAC, a uh, subgroup in Brazil looked at uh, infant uh, antibodies at birth, so passive immunity. There was no significant difference in the maternal placental transfer of um, immunoglobulins. However, you can see that almost across the board, with the exception of RSV, respiratory syncytial virus, HEUs had lower acquisition of passive immunity. And this has been borne out in numerous studies. AFRIN did a... Um, systematic review and was able to identify several different immune-compromised states. Do we know if they have clinical importance? Well, some studies have showed this. In South Africa, in four provinces, they were able to identify children who were hospitalized for pneumonia within the first six months of life, and what we can see is a 40% uh, increased risk of all lower respiratory tract infections among HEU children hospitalized compared to HU children. And this translated into a much higher mortality uh, risk among HEUs, particularly for respiratory syncytial virus and influenza. We see this as well in a Botswana study where they were looking at both treatment failure and mortality in HIV-exposed uninfected infants. Um, and and mort yeah, mortality and, and treatment failure. With, a, uh, with children under six months having a twofold increased rate if they were HEU in pneumonia treatment failure and a sixfold increased rate of mortality um, if they were HIV exposed uninfected. A little bit off target from this, but yet another issue is growth. With work we've done in Botswana using randomized control data, we can see that the um, children, HEU children who were exposed in utero to triple antiretrovirals in the aqua lines uh, had lower length for age Z scores throughout the first 24 months of life compared to infants exposed only to AZT. And we can also see that in a second large study performed as a cross-sectional analysis in five health districts in Botswana, 
that stunting was significantly higher among children, HEU children, compared to HU children. Um, and we, can we were able to use mediation analysis to identify particularly in children over two years to five years of age that 67% 60 of this was due to um, a birth weight of less than 2,500 grams. So it goes back to low birth weight and birth weight issues. Neurodevelopment, mixed stories. Stancy's going to talk to you a little bit about neurodevelopment studies. Um, Megan McHenry also has abstract number 82. This is one, this is work from um, Thailand and Cambodia that showed that there are minor differences in um, the, the uh, verbal IQ, full-scale IQ, and the Binet bead memory test, but th the clinical significance of this is not quite understood. Megan McHenry's uh, abstract number 82 shows the same type of challenges. So the surveillance challenge. Um, Jason Brophy was kind enough to share this slide with me. Um, you saw earlier that there is a changing dynamic, and we've seen it on several slides this morning in what is being taken over time. So not only do we need to think of HEUs in terms of what, would, what they were exposed to, but each cohort may have a different issue that they're facing over time as we change what antiretrovirals we're using. This is true in Botswana as well. So developed and developing countries both have this challenge. I've arbitrarily created some uh, word clouds. If we assume and, and Often we're arguing that HEUs, it's this in utero exposure that's causing the difference. If we assume that the drivers are the ARV exposure or HRV, HIV or maternal health, what we design as an intervention is very different than if what, it, what the drivers are are really maternal health, infant feeding practices, poor access to health care. And so we really need to get at the bottom of what the drivers are. And it's a very challenging thing to do, particularly in observational studies or cross-sectional studies. Do we have to reinvent the wheel? Do we have to sit here and plan for HEUs? And the answer is no. We, the HIV platform itself has created some great infrastructures. UNICEF has some great infrastructure around maternal child health in general. We have clinics that work in many settings. Some are more challenged than others. We're starting, even in resource-constrained settings, to have electronic medical record systems to be able to follow children. We have community advisory boards. The Ministry of Health are open to uh, designing health policies to promote survival and thriving. Clinical research is obviously present. We're all represented. Most of all of us are represented by that. And bench research is critically important here because we, that will help us get at some of the mechanisms so that we can design interventions. And again, Nelson Mandela said, AIDS is clearly a disaster, effect, effectively wiping out development gains to the past decades and sabotaging the future. And that story has dramatically changed because of the response to HIV. I'm concerned that a decade from now, we may look back and look at the HEUs and look at a missed opportunity. We now have sustainable development goals, and I just selected a very few of them, but whether it be good health and well-being, quality education, no poverty, decent work and economic growth, or reduced inequalities, in countries that have high prevalence of HIV in which more than one in five infants is HIV exposed, uninfected, these developmental goals are in jeopardy unless we design interventions and take some action. Jim Kim, who's now president of the World Bank, when he was with the World Health Organization, set up three by five, a very ambitious objective of getting three million people on treatment in resource-limited settings by 2005. It didn't happen until 2007, but the very goal setting itself created the momentum to make it happen. 
and much of what exists today in terms of goal setting, including the AIDS-free generation, start free, stay free, AIDS-free, is because goals have been established and set. We don't have goals for the HEUs yet. It's very challenging because there's mixed reasons why these things are happening. The social structure issues are definitely at play here. How much of that is driving it versus the in utero exposure or the health of the mothers? We cannot say, you've heard multiple studies today and you'll hear it if you're at IAS next week. However, we, have, we cannot go another year without setting up some structure and some goals for our HEU population growing at over 1.1 million children per year. And obviously, if we're going to eliminate mother-to-child transmission, an even larger number. So it always seems impossible until it's done. And this one is quite formidable because the size of the population is quite big, but we have to start somewhere. If you're interested in this topic and you're attending IAS, there's a HIV exposed uninfected workshop that will be taking place tomorrow, starting at 10.15 in the morning, and you're welcome to attend. And I just wanted to thank individuals who helped in putting this presentation together or in sharing slides with me, and particularly Amy Slowgrove, who has been working tirelessly with me over the past year to work on HIV-exposed uninfected children and a platform for them. Thank you.